Dude, well, you know they <laughs> sold my they sold my cage. <clears throat> you heard that story? I you bought a cage. This. Yeah, I bought one. I, yeah. I remember. No, that was the plan, dude. I bought a fucking cage to go in the office. I remember seeing something about that. Who, who yeah. you say they sold it? Like someone was holding so, it for you? Yeah. Or? Well, so what happened was There's I bought it. For that. I, I bought it. I bought it in 2020. <laughs> this UFC gym was going out of business in Austin. And he's like, dude. He's saying like, you have it for four grand, but it has to be out today. And so yeah. I went and got a U-Haul, drove over to Austin broke this cage down and um bought it and then yeah i kept it in storage for like two and a half years so my cost of ownership was just like through the roof on this thing paying 150 <laughs> bucks a month yeah and i get a text one day that's like we're sad to see you go thank you for being a customer and i'm like what the fuck's that about and they liquidated my unit it was like <laughs> a so, storage war yeah type and thing, so huh? my fucking cage hey, were you not paying your bill or something or? no they said there was a problem with my payment it's my fucking company card that like they've had it for two fucking years Damn. and um anyways yeah it was like and then i start reading these agreements on these storage units and they're a fucking grift like it is crazy like they can pretty much sell your shit and nothing do there's it. nothing that you can do about it so anyways yeah so i don't have maybe you'll see it on storage wars yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, we got well you know what's funny in here. so a lot of like a lot of cages now they have pin systems that you just like take the pins out this one had uh bolts and it had like 200 bolts and so it took me and jake seven hours with two impact wrenches to take this thing apart wow. and um and you never we, put it together yeah and we had a schematic <laughs> that we drew of how to get it back together Whoever bought that cage doesn't have that schematic. Yeah, so I was like, dude, they're screwed. I was like, honestly, like you'd probably have to like, Zuckerberg. Had, I would have paid someone to take that, you know? Was so. it one of the UFC PI cages? Like, like the no, real was, octagon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was 30 foot cage. It was on a platform. Damn. So it was raised up. It was sick. Yeah. And the plan was <laughs> we we're going to get a warehouse office and put it in the office. And now that we're like growing, I'm I got like some fucking, mats if you want them. I'll give them. You got some mats? I yeah. got some mats in my house too. I got some twelve by twelves. You can like stick them together. And Me and like Jacob talked about that. It's like making making yeah, yeah. mats at uh um okay. I guess we'll get this podcast started. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> shoot the shit, just like we were doing. Like people, I don't know. I'll probably cut in this this conversation <laughs> about the the octagon so people can hear yeah man <laughs> what the status is of our gauge jiu-jitsu bitcoin <laughs> jiu -jitsu. and gas. it's it's, it's like, a pretty base trifecta yeah. of, of things right so <laughs> <laughs> anyway so we got a good episode today got uh alex alex squared we got the the alex's from vertice oil tools on the show today um funny you know alex uh known you for years now um came to some of our early happy hours known you on linkedin and then uh alex how did we get linked up again i think through jason yeah, yeah through the jason that's yeah yeah that's yeah. right that's right and uh uh yeah alex invested and has an angel investor in our rounds so you know part of the friends family and fools he was one of the fools and so <laughs> I'm okay being a fool <laughs> and also trains jiu-jitsu with me uh at revolution dojo yeah. in houston so uh real quick you know to to just give people some context of who vertice is what is vertice what do you guys do? Yeah. You want me to take that one? Yeah, you can take that one. Drive a little deeper. Um, so we started in 2018 uh, as a completions company, originally targeting sliding sleeves. So our founder, Mohammed Soraya, he's a completions guru, had um, an, inter an interesting idea to design this limitless sliding sleeve. Um, and you kind of saw what happened with sleeves in Canada. NCS was blowing and going. They went public, I think, in 2017. Uh, with their sleeve and their intention was to come down to the lower 48 and just dominate. Yeah. Um, you said that, that was in, NCS that was, multi stage. That was NCS. Or, okay. I think they were like a billion dollar market cap at, yeah. at, at one time. Yeah. Um, and so we had this idea, or Mohammed had this idea to, to commercialize a, a limitless sleeve design, which basically sliding sleeve that you could run without coil tubing or, or, or without any type of intervention. Um, yeah. And so. Limitless meaning you could drop a single ball and activate multiple sleeves and you don't have to worry about adjusting the ball size and ball seats. Um, so it's really novel technology. Um, we got it probably qualified in, you know, probably mid 2018, just shortly after uh, we picked up our initial investor, which was SEF uh, Partners through their Ventures Fund. That I think that closed in February of 2018. I was a number two employee, um, came on as a CFO, yeah. janitor, HR, legal, like kind of doing all <laughs> yeah. kinds of stuff. And, and you're, you know what it's like running a startup. Yeah, you know, for you sure. Do all kinds of stuff. Like yeah. 
clean yeah. the toilets and yeah stuff. cfo but you're, you're also stuff, yeah. yeah picking up slack everywhere else yeah. too. <laughs> these are it guys he yeah, does, does a lot of stuff too. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and then goodwin came in end of 2018 i think yep. you're probably like number four yeah four or five four. can't remember um but the idea was to go to market with the sleeve um but that market got away from us um what do you apache mean? and what do you Hess, mean by that well i think all the sleeve guys tried to come down in the u.s yeah because they were like we have this pinpoint system you get better fracks more predictable frack propagation yeah this is it but lower 48 guys are like hey we just we just run plug and perf and we pump the shit out of our wells we're increasing propent yeah we get better wells and so there's kind of this back and forth between like which technology is is better yeah and plug and perf kind of won that yeah that tug of war right and so you had a few holdouts in the u.s hess being one of them i think they were running sliding sleeves up in the bakken up until 2019 2020. yeah so the only place that i saw sleeves at around that time and it worked well the, for them was up in the bakken yeah um but they eventually switched to plug and perf which you know suggests that you know maybe you are getting a better yeah better well yeah uh but you're probably also bit breaking up more rock and introducing other elements like parent child communication but that's a, a yeah. separate discussion yeah um so luckily Mohammed, being kind of the completions guru he is had a war chest of like patents and ideas that he's just kind of collected throughout the years you need to meet him at some point um and so he was like all right well what else can we do and so this is the a, logical this pivot is a classic pivot yeah, oh, yeah. Pivot story. yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> the logical pivot was frack plugs and so you know we were kind of working on that and we had this frack plug design which uh works with a flapper mechanism which basically allows you to have contingency in the event of any type of issue when you're you're setting plugs so like in a preset mm -hmm. uh screen out we have this frack perf, plug design perf gun misfire things perf like gun that. misfire that allows you to bypass the plug and I'll effectively cancel it right like you set it and you're like oh shit i need to i need to cancel that like mm -hmm. there's a mechanism and procedure to to do that and so that was that was one idea that we had we started working on that and the other idea kind of came to us just by luck and through connections um so um this is where we get to refrax um so independent operator in the eagleford probably shouldn't name their names um, <laughs> uh, came to us and said hey look we're we've done a study on all the refract technologies we found what we think works the best in terms of just reliability and productivity um, but at the time they were running um what industry calls a cut and pull refract right like our back off refract yeah. yeah yeah and so they would run an inner string of casing in inside of a, an existing well bore they'd run it all the way to the surface they'd go back in and run a cutter um and you know basically pull out the the remaining drill string in your vertical section and set that aside and kind of reuse that in the existing well and when it worked it worked great because you had full zonal isolation your purse would propagate where you wanted them to go and you're basically plug and perfing like you would a, yeah, a brand normally well. yeah um but half the time they would cut through their existing string of casing the five and a half inch yeah in the eagle for and so when it's that pretty, happens it's pretty hard to control a, a jet cutter down yeah hole. yeah well, so well, you, you know this probably better than it's I mean. uh anything with intervention related uh, interventions you know just are prone to issues whether it's you know accidental or unintended consequences things like that so they're just running run into a multitude of problems so yeah yeah so that was probably half the half the time they were doing these jobs they'd have failures um, so they came to Vertice and he said, hey, it'd be nice if we had a tool that we could just run um, attached to the inner string of casing that we're running and hydraulic hydraulically disconnect. And Mohammed just like gets out of a sheet of paper. He's like, all right, mocks up a tool. Two or three months later, that tool is run in, in, in whole in Carnes County. Uh, That's crazy. For, <laughs> yeah. I think it was May of 2019. Everything That's went right. flawlessly. Yeah. Um, but basically they went from, you know, a drilling or a refract cycle that would probably take anywhere from 25 to 30 days. And they've gotten that down to like 10. Yeah. Less yeah. So 10. in terms of like AFE costs on refract that went, that, that almost got cut in half. Like they were probably doing these jobs for five, six million. Now you could do refract for two and a half to four. And when I say refract, wow. I mean, mechanically isolated refract. We kind of are guilty of conflating that with like bullhead refracts, which is. They're, they're technically refracts, but 
yeah. industries kind of migrated to zonal isolation or me yeah. mechanically isolated. Yeah, you know, I started running refract liners from Venture, which is expandable casing back in 2014, 2015. And we're doing a lot of those um, up in the Barnett with like Chesapeake and mm -hmm. some of these. And ideal was, you know, we'd go run, you know, call it 2000. 3,000 feet of pipe and we'd expand it and had elastomer spaced out and that expandable to isolate your perfs because back then people were just trying to um, dump cement and plug yeah. perfs and right. like learned really quickly that hey it just goes into the heel and yeah. um, you know you're not able to you're not it didn't work and they were trying all different types of like resins and you know uh, and chemicals and shit like that and um, like the answer was no, you need to go down there and actually set new pipe and get yeah. isolation. Problem with uh, expandable pipe is that it's expensive. Um, right. You know, back then, I don't know what it cost them now. I'm sure it's something similar, but it's about a hundred dollars a foot. It's like quarter million to do it. Yeah. Expandable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it works. Easy, it's easy. great when it works. Like you have big ID and you know you can get yeah. tools down pretty easily. Yeah. And so, um, but I was interested when I saw y'all's tool because um, one, it sounds like it's probably much cheaper solution to get it get it down hole and then hearing the story of mom coming up with it and two months later having it i mean down in a well that's pretty fucking impressive i mean this is you know always laugh um you know, like tech founders in silicon valley you know they're they're dealing with with bits and yeah. it's like yeah. it's easy to make software and ship it but to make old the old atoms and like yeah, make, yeah the, this, the, this complex like the, casing system is it's pretty impressive the, the mvp i guess is the tech guys call it right it's yeah. much different yeah. than uh, downhole tools yeah. right? yeah. Yeah. it's much different when you're trashing a multi-million dollar wellbore or you know get like, someone yeah, hurt and so, yeah. instead of just shipping some code to see if like yeah. a, a email works so something. the the tool explain to me how uh how it works. All right, um, this is is where you kind of we have to phone a friend. All right, we'll let we'll yeah. let a good one come take yeah. the mic. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, you know, back then, I mean, it's, there's been an evolution. So back from 2019 to today, there's probably been multiple evolutions of optimization, tool design changes, and stuff like that. But what we focused on uh, early on was trying to just do, you know, create something that was conventional, simple. Um, so back then, it was kind of hydraulically actuated via ball drop. Um, just, uh, but it was optimized for a specific hole size. So what, what, uh, Alex was mentioning is kind of these mechanical isolated refracts, like, and with expandables, you know, you're putting a specific, uh, size liner inside of five and a half or inside three and a half. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to have the, the biggest ID so you can put plug and per guns yeah. and, and plugs through it for the frack. Then you also have to have the slimmest OD cause you're trying to pump cement and you're trying to isolate uh, that annual so you so you kind of like kind of have two big constraints uh that you don't you, you have them in say normal new wells but it's a lot bigger a lot bigger tools a lot bigger clearances and things like yeah. that so so essentially the first the first iteration was a simple uh liner system more of a drop-off liner not even a liner hanger system at that time and uh um made it to where it had the right id the right ods you know where you can rotate and do all those things um, and then at the end of the job, we were able to, to drop a ball and release. So we, what we did is we just kind of optimized specific, like fit for a purpose, if you will, for yeah. that, that type of application. So on that system, would you run this down? I mean, essentially, would you have tubing as an inner string on, on the casing and then drop a ball down and disconnect or how so, did you guys so so we it? wouldn't have like an inner string, probably like, maybe like you're familiar, like some of the offshore stuff is just a work string. And at that time actually it was. Uh, this is very kind of like this is very early days. People were actually running four inch casing all the way to surface and just putting our tool kind of in the middle. And then they realized, oh, well, this works really well, so we can just cross over to you know like a two and seven eighths, uh, two and three eighths work string or something like that. So, um, mm -hmm. and that made that optimized things even even further. So yeah, and then you just you know, yeah at that at that time you drop a ball to release. So since then we've kind of uh, optimized some more mechanically uh, release liner system liner hangers like a multitude of different type of packers to optimize for, for refracts. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. And the, 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 the application as a whole for, you know, some people call them casing and casing refracts or mechanically isolated refracts. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of like doing some of the same stuff the drilling guys do for new wells, but you also have to clean them out, they, you know, be an intervention guy to be able to clean them out. And then you also have to, have to know the frack side of things. So it's, uh, that's the it, thing, man. Like when I was running expandables, like, 
eighty percent of the work was in cleaning out the well bore mm -hmm. and getting oh, yeah. it to a condition and some people just didn't understand this and um you know try to cut corners on on our clean out procedure and you do that it's a bad time yeah uh, for expandables it's it, it, it's it definitely it matters even more because yeah. of the tight tolerances yeah and everything. yeah for sure yes so i became an expert in fishing out expandables um <laughs> and um but yeah so you know just that that well bore prep is it's a, another beast too especially you know if you have any sand coming in from from perfs you know just trying to get tools down down to bottom when you have those really tight clearances and, and restrictions and so yeah it's pretty interesting to hear you know you have to take both the id and od into consideration because obviously you want to limit the amount of id restriction that you have to be able to get tools but then you have considerations for the annulus the size of the annulus yeah. too and so when you guys are when you guys run one of these do you have to pump cement behind it yeah so if you're um it, it's kind of you know there's been some trials with no uncemented and using multitude of packers in between stages kind of like the the old sleeve uh systems that people were using but uh it's kind of the industry's kind of standardized on pumping a specific type of cement it's like latex cement so it's mm -hmm. uh, uh just because of that tight annulus when you pump it with this latex cement it's lower pressure you're able to uh, move the cement and, and get it all the way back to surfaces or not all the way back to the iron chop, if you will. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, you're covering it up with cement. So, you're covering those old purse with cement. You're trying to cover the lateral as best as possible with pretty uniform cement. It's yeah. not much cement. I think it's like 20 barrels. Uh, like for Eagle Verge, yeah, like 30, 35 barrels, you know. How are the uh, interesting point, you know, you're, you're pumping cement and you have old perfs uh, behind pipe, you know potential for those perfs to take that cement so it's kind of hard to know yeah. what volume you need it, to, it is you need to pump. And, and that does happen like uh so we do some refract liners in the bach and and uh sometimes we're pumping like two to three hundred percent excess cement in those scenarios because they're accounting for how much cement they're going to lose during that during that job yeah for sure and, and latex tends to do a good job and fill up some some void space too but uh you're, you're going to have losses almost every job like you prefer not as much as other places, but yeah. you'll, you'll always lose something yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I imagine. Yeah, latex uh, cement, I'm not I'm not familiar with that, so I'll have to go look that up uh, Yeah, it's kind of, uh, I'm not a cement expert as well, I'm not but, either, but so. it's kind of like the latex. I mean, not being uh, familiar with it's not saying much because <laughs> I don't know much about cement anyway. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's kind of similar to kind of like latex uh, paint uh, design, so uh, yeah. from what I understand. But yeah. Uh, Interesting. But it works for this. You know, to give you an example, if you were to pump conventional cement in these refracts with a, this tight annulus, you'd be at like 10,000 PSI, like a barrel or maybe two barrels a minute while pumping it. Yeah. Versus like Lake Tex, you can be like 3,000 PSI at three, four barrels a minute. So, gotcha. so it's a big, big difference. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so for you guys, is for Vertice, is that the, the focus of the company now is these refrac? uh uh liners or do y'all have any other tools and services that, that y'all do oh i mean uh, i would say what probably half the business is refract focused okay uh, um i mean we've kind of found our niche and it's a it's a space that a lot of customers come to us for the first time they've ever done it and so they yeah. lean on us a lot and so yeah. we so from our technical side of things and um kind of uh engineering horsepower tends to lean more to the refract side and the technologies and the equipment but the other half of our business is like new completions and frack plugs some frack gotcha. sleeves, some traditional liner hangers as well. What does it look like you know, if an EMP engages with y'all um, from like the engineering side on y'all side? You know, like when I was at Inventure, I mean, every we had standard systems, but we had to make sure that, you know, every system was engineered for that specific application. And so we had a bunch of engineers that were, you know, doing those. It wasn't like you just take one tool off the shelf and go run it in any well. So if uh, EMP engages with y'all, what does that process look like? Cause you mentioned it may be their first time doing a, doing a refract. So do you guys help consult? Um, or do you just say, Hey, what are you trying to achieve? And we'll get our tool down hole and, yeah. and, and get yeah. it set. I, I think it depends on how sophisticated the, the operator is and if they've done them before, but, um, you know, something that Alex has been instrumental, uh, instrumental on here recently is, for operators that haven't ever done a refrack or they're trying to identify, they say, hey, we have these thousand wells in this uh, this part of the Eagle Firth or whatever basin they're in. 
Um, we've been able to help identify through Alex's uh, kind of background and horsepower, uh, help them identify like candidates, like uh, refract candidates and, and, and uh, select the best refract, help them select the best refract yeah. candidates. So we've kind of been doing some consulting on that side. Yeah. Um, don't know if you want yeah. to kind of share. So, or, yeah, it depends on operator, but some operators come to us and they're like, hey, we don't know anything about refracts. Can you just tell us, like, just give us a lay of the land, who's doing what, like, does yeah. it work? Take a look at our wells, tell us, you know, what you think may or may not work. Uh, so for those operators, we can help with candidate selection. Um, so I built this database that basically looks at the entire universe that we've been able to pull data on for um, mechanically isolated refracts pulled the production data and built this simulator that can, it's almost like predictive analytics. I know you're doing some AI stuff with, yeah. with yeah. some of your tools, but yeah. um, you know, basically if you give me any API number, we can pull that well, look at the production data, see which county it's in, see which, you know, who the operator is. And we can plot with, you know, the ARPS equation, like what we think the refract type curve will look like. And, and generally like, you know, uh, we, we've kind of back tested this and yeah. the accuracy has been pretty high because yeah, if you think about it, you're refracting a well that you already know what the geology looks like you've because you have data production data, yeah. right? Like you have a free look yeah. into like geology. Yeah. You don't have to run logs or anything like that. Yeah. And you got close ology, you know what like yeah. your neighbor wells yeah. look like. And so. Yeah. You've already been down hole and drilled the well and produced. Yeah. And so you have as much data as you're ever going to have. On pretty it, much. So. Yeah. yeah. So you can, you can plot what you think the production is going to be. To, to pretty accurately um then you can go build your afe like all right i think it's you know it's five thousand foot lateral it'll probably cost me you know three and change to do it and then you can model economics and so like we can help with with that on the front end and we can also kind of compare where the operators acreage is or their pdps are relative to you know where other operators have refract and yeah so, like if you yeah. tell me you're in Carnes county i can pull every single refract in Carnes county and map production for that refrac that, that that helps you get an idea of like what you think the, the yeah. production curve will look like. Yeah. So you know, it sounds like um, people are having success with refracts down in the Eagleford. What are you guys seeing in, in the other basins? You know, one is there activity or people trying to do this out in other basins now? Are they having any success with it? You know, like I mentioned, we were doing those ones with Chesapeake up in the Barnett a long mm -hmm. time ago. Um, obviously, you know. Um, people are going to be looking at how to extract more value out of their assets yeah. and out in the, in the Permian. And, and so what are y'all seeing on that front from like a macro perspective in, in the industry or people exploring it? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So if you think about just kind of top three basins for refract activity, Eagleford's up there. Um, I'll talk big picture about the market. Yeah. There's probably five or 600 mechanically isolated refracts that we're aware of. We've done almost half of them. Um, and so when you parse through that data, about, I think, 250 to 300 are in the Eagleford. Bakken, you probably have 100 to 150. Haynesville, probably 50-ish. And the rest is kind of scattered throughout the rest of lower 48. Gotcha. Um, but in terms of activity, Eagleford is kind of front and center because we know it works. Um, I think you had Bar Bob Barbea on a few months ago, and he's a big proponent about frac reorientation uh, being one of the reasons why the productivity is so good. Um, but, uh, you know, you have a lot of well control, you know, if you're in Carnes trough, so that's Carnes County, DeWitt County, um, live yeah. Oak to an extent, like you're going to have a good well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how the industry is, right. They, they find something that works. Someone that's done a bunch of them. <laughs> Gravitate and Conoco's that, yeah. done about 50 per year yeah. in Carnes trough for, I don't know, past four or five years. Yeah. Which is funny. Cause like talking about like using sleeves in the lower 48, it was Conoco yeah. Bur Burlington formally yeah. that we're doing the sleeves up and up in the Bakken and so yeah. it's funny to hear them you know come up and and both the sleeve and the and the refrack uh, yeah. conversations because I've seen seen them doing both of those things and and I think on. uh you know Eugerford's led the way in the last few years um for for refracts but uh, based on what we've talked to to operators um I think this year or at least by next year uh, Bakken will probably have a bit more refract well counts than even than Eagleford because uh, you're seeing a lot more Hummer players uh, uh, try try for the first time there. Yeah, um, yeah and to in, give you an example of that with without naming customers, but uh, there are two operators last year that probably did in the Bakken that did somewhere between five and ten refracts in, in the Bakken. 
this year, I think both of them are going to do 50 plus each. Right. And wow. so like they've gone from like five to 50. Yeah. They're scaling like a up year. pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, hopefully we see that kind of pick up elsewhere, but you know, if you're talking total numbers, I think last year was around 150 line yeah. refracts. This year, we think it's going to be three to 400. So like, wow. it's okay. Meanwhile, you got the rig count that just keeps going down. So yeah. like, this is kind of like one of the you know shining spots within the industry where, where you have growing. activity is yeah. actually growing on the on the upside. Earlier, you you gave out a statistic about the cost of refracts going down. What what were those numbers again? Yeah, so we've seen as low as two and a half. Yeah. Um. I mean, you have some operators that are cowboys, and they like is that end to end? I mean, yeah. With mm -hmm. with with the, the so pressure pump pumping is like and, probably eighty yeah. percent. I was gonna say that's like, probably yeah, yeah. of the cost. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and you're seeing some people do some interesting things on the frac side to try to reduce that cost. So. Uh, you know, the, the what I would call the sophisticated refract guys, um, they're also doing these in, in conjunction with new fracks. So they'll have like a refract well on the pad and they'll have three new wells and they'll kind of zip them in and mm -hmm. they're, they're getting some cost savings because that yeah, frack side. Yeah, economy of scale. Because if you're just yeah. doing a, and some people are doing single um, uh, single well refracts and they do work, um, but the pressure pumping cost is kind of through the roof because you, you have a, a crew that's on location that's able to pump 120, 130 barrels a minute, but you're only pumping say 70 to 90 yeah. on a refrac, and you still um, gotta pay for the 120. You're still paying for it, and then plus if it's a single well, you you have that downtime while you're pumping that's wireline and all I bet that. you see some innovation come around. Um, you know, a solution that's more cost effective for uh, single well applications because like right now it makes sense. It's like if you can, you know, group it up with mm -hmm. new fracks. Mm -hmm take advantage of economies of scale okay cool you, you already have the crew on location but yeah. you know there's probably going to be a lot of of uh, single refracts out there too so it's like how can you do that yeah more, and more I've, I've just heard recently i mean i think people have been using this term they call it remote fracks where people run basically a a, a, a mono line or a remote line from a, a, a new well pad to a refract pad that's exactly pad. where my mind went that's like that's exactly two thousand feet or more away yeah. I, I forget the uh, someone told me this like a couple of weeks ago it was the 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 distance was kind of absurd that's that's All exactly right. where my mind went but, and i was like what i love about the oil field is that we're some resourceful and innovative yeah, motherfuckers yeah. like we'll figure out a way to we, do we it we will cheaper, figure it so. out that's right yeah. that's awesome yeah imagine the uh having high pressure lines going across you know two thousand feet that's uh that's something else like, i don't but... want to get out of my van i want to stay here <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it's, it's funny yeah, imagine <laughs> that thing breaking and whipping off and tag you from half a mile away well, and the thing, the thing is you'll have wire line over there on that one well over there it's two thousand feet away or whatever and they won't even know you're fracking unless they can hear the kind of the the the, the engines yeah. that far away you know yeah. so, so it is uh it's kind of kind of interesting yeah that is definitely interesting um is vertice based here in houston yeah, well, we're in uh, Stafford, Texas, so just on the yeah. south south side of town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do y'all is that where the yard is too, or do y'all have yard somewhere else? Yeah, this is our main main hub office and and shop where we build all the all the equipment and and send 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 them out. We have some kind of like satellite space in in other basins, but there it's more kind of uh, more uh, store stage equipment and things like that. But but pretty much all the equipment's cool. built built here and and shipped from here for the most part. I'll have to come out sometime and record a video at the shop and yeah. take a look at the at the tool and, and how it works. That'd be that'd be good. You could probably explain it to me better than <laughs> <laughs> just look at it and like, oh, yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. Just, just yeah. A Chinese finger trap. Yeah, yeah if, if you ever want to get some uh some man days as a liner hanger hand again, let, let me know. We're always uh that's <laughs> always a, looking. Yeah, you know, it's funny is uh we just went and shot this YouTube video with Underdog Wireline on what is a wireline. Oh yeah, truck. I saw that. It was a million dollar wireline yeah, truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Badass video. Yeah. And um, anyways, just yesterday on Twitter, it's what I told Underdog. It's like, hey, y'all should let me run wireline for a day, come out to a frag job, and record That's a piece good of content. content. Oh yeah, it is. I was telling, I was telling the team, I was like, dude, if I went back and like worked in the oil field for like six months, I'd probably have a million followers on TikTok. So it's like, <laughs> seems like that's like a worthy six months stint to go do that yeah you know i went down this rabbit hole of watching like truckers that just like deliver loads and like there's yeah. some truckers that have like millions of followers and Dude. they're just like GoProing everything there's some like, roughnecks and like pipeliners on on tiktok that have millions of followers yeah. and that's what i tell people it's like the work that we do is really it's fucking cool. interesting. It's pretty yeah. interesting yeah yeah, <clears throat> yeah. and we take it for granted because we're surrounded by it all the time but it's like yeah. it's like the, the type of stuff that we're talking about on the show like this is cool fucking technology yeah. and it's hard problems too right and for sure so, smart people solving solving hard problems that's what that's what i love about the industry so 
you know, for you guys, if anyone's listening to the show um, and and they want to check out Vertice and get some get some info on uh, refrac uh, liners, where can they find you guys? What's the website? You on uh, I mean, we're we're both of us are on LinkedIn. Uh, website's just VerticeOldTools dot uh, cool. They can inquire on, on there. Um, Perfect. We're pretty pretty easy to find and. Uh, Cool. Yeah. Re dash frack. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we do own re dash frack. Also, you guys are looking uh, to hire as well. You'll have a job on Collide. Yeah, yeah. I, don't know if I saw that. I put uh, out a bounty okay. the other day. I said, uh, yeah? if anyone refers someone to this job, I'll pay him five hundred bucks. Oh, they have nice. to be a jujitsu practitioner. And got uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, the interesting stat: <laughs> like twenty five percent of our workforce does jujitsu. Is that like, right? Yeah, we have twenty. I think eighteen to twenty employees, and like oh, four or five of them. You know, we're, we're probably the same. I mean, really? we have me, Jake, Julie. So it's three people right there out of <laughs> out of thirteen. So <laughs> yeah. that's our prerequisite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. got to roll with me, and I not <laughs> judge if we are. You or not. <laughs> so go check out uh, Collide Jobs. Um, they're looking for a technical uh, sales manager. I believe was the uh, yeah te- technical sales rep in uh, Midland, actually. Okay, uh, based out in Midland. Midland. Okay, yep. cool. Yep. yep. So check that out on Collide. And if you refer someone to it and they get hired, hit me up and I'll pay you 500 bucks for it. So cool. Guys, uh, appreciate y'all taking the time. Uh, if y'all enjoyed this episode, make sure to share it with a friend. Um, reach out to to both of the Alex's. They're, they're great guys to chop it up with. So appreciate y'all coming on the show.